Once again, good morning, everybody. I hope you're well, and uh, let's continue to pray for each other as we uh, slowly emerge out of our cocoons and, and begin to, to make life as normal as it can be at this moment. Let's certainly pray for each other and may especially our Eucharistic celebrations give us our hope and our strength. So let's continue with the story of Paul. He, from Philippi, comes to Thessalonica or Thessalonica and from there to Beroia, I'm sure I'm butchering that name, and from there to Athens. It's a very short visit in Athens, but boy is it powerful, is it loaded. I could do an entire day's retreat on it. The only reason I'm not doing it is because I didn't forewarn you and you probably are busy for the day. Um, now, when Paul visited Athens, this is, this is not the prime time in its history, yet. Athens was the center, and really, the center of quintessential Greek culture. I don't know what place we would call in the United States to be, you know, quintessentially American. Um, uh, Dayton, yeah, a little bit. But what are the chances that a wandering Jewish preacher could take on the philosophical and cultural sages of Athens? What are the chances? Well, let's see how it goes. Now, after... After Luke leading us just for a little bit in that first person account, suddenly he's back to the third person account. However, the surprising thing is that Luke has Athens down. The details that he gives might as well be uh, that he was with them, although he does not write that way. How does he have such intimate knowledge of Athens? So the, 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 the small things that he describes that could be left out. The presence of st statues and shrines everywhere, for example. Shrines to anonymous gods, for example. And they were rampant. Philosophers running around, ready to debate with anyone. It was a pastime. I would have loved to have lived there in that time. Some skeptical about religious claims, others cautious, but also Paul's knowledge of the Areopagus, Areopagus. So much so that when we see the details that he includes there, we are inclined to ask ourselves whether this is Paul's story or is it Luke's story? Don't know. That Paul was in Athens is attested by other literature, Pauline himself, he talks about him being in Athens. Now did the scene take place in the manner that Luke describes? Again, it is an account of Pauline encounter with Athens or is it Luke's encounter with the Greek culture? Maybe it's a mixture of the two. As the commentator that I read says, maybe this is how Luke wanted the story to be. We'll see. Now, remember you're dealing with, you're dealing with Greek philosophers. And Christianity as, as, as a movement, as a, as a culture, is so nascent. So you're dealing with thousands of years of history and philosophy and culture and along comes Christianity and it's proclaiming salvation to the world. So there is a, a sense of this is not the battle of equals. How much philosophy, Greek philosophy, can Luke handle? Well, I think at least he has deep knowledge about it. He even refers to one of their, one of their poets in, the, in, in Paul's speech. So 
he may not be a philosopher in the way the Greek philosophers were, but boy, he's not shy about expounding his knowledge. And Luke has managed to pack much into this brief scene, although it's really not a debate in the philosophical um, Greek debates that these philosophers used to engage in. It's really not a debate. Did he succeed in revol re revolutionizing Greek philosophy? Did it change Greek philosophy forever in this intervention? Not really, but an attempt has been made. So, what's Luke's bigger story? What's the larger story? This is Luke's attempt to put Christianity on equal footing with Greek philosophy. What is, what is all philosophy trying to do? Answer the existential questions. All philosophy is about that. There are various sections of philosophy like cosmology for example studies about the cosmos and, 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 and what holds everything together. Right? There's metaphysics that which is beyond what we see physically. Right? So all of philosophy in some way is trying to unravel the mystery of life. And the Greek philosophers debated about that and here comes along Paul this wandering preacher trying to contribute to those to the answers to the existential questions that Greek philosophy has been trying to answer for the longest time. This is the gospel's encounter with the world which it is about to change. Christianity is now playing with the big boys. Now Luke's approach is also noteworthy. Remember that he does not find it necessary to condemn anything of what he has seen. All he does is to assert the truth of the gospel. I spoke about evangelization the other day in, in, in similar terms. He points out to the ambiguous search in Greek religions because you have the unknown God and try to give that search a concrete shape, meaning perhaps even a personal face. A human face. It's what the Greeks have been searching and, and looking for. Paul says, well, what you're looking for here, let me give it to you concretely. Notice emphasis on there is a shrine to an unknown God whom they unknowingly worship. It's almost like a play on words. Remember he had accused the Jews also of crucifying Jesus in their ignorance. Here is another population that builds shrines to the unknown gods whom they unknowingly worship. Now later in, the sp later in his speech, Paul will talk about God has overlooked the time of ignorance. Right? So you worship this unknown God in an unknowing way, but God is overlooking your time of ignorance, then he'll call for repentance. So really Luke is providing the answer to the entire philosophical quest. Whether he succeeds or not is another question. An attempt is made. And my answer is that he probably succeeds partially. Remember Paul would later say in 1 Corinthians 1.23 the gospel is a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Greeks. Gives me the, the, the idea that really they didn't, did not make the kind of inroads that they would have anticipated. But he was barely there for a few days. What is Luke slash Paul's answer to the unknown gods that the Greek have tried to capture? in their shrines and statues, in their ignorance, right? What is the answer? What is, what is Paul or Luke proposing uh, as the answer? He says, this unknown God is the God in whom we live and move and have our being. It's all of creation. All that we are, everything that is held together, that you are debating about. We can tell you 
who that God is. And he says that all our questions lead to the God who will judge the world with justice. The use of the word justice is clever actually. Because in, in Greek philosophy, justice is one of those virtues that is highly, that is highly um, uh, regarded. And so playing the word with the word justice is, is again typical of Luke's understanding of, of, of some amount of Greek, Greek life and philosophy. The Greek philosophers should catch on to the concept of justice. It's central to their social life, this principle of justice. And then Paul calls them to repentance. And maybe he has the Greeks hooked. But not quite. I'll tell you in just a little bit why. It is important to, to note that the, the name Christ is not mentioned in this entire speech. And for me, that was that's a little bit of a, um, of a letdown. Paul only talks about this man whom God has appointed. And as confirmation that this man was the face they want to see or the God they want to know, as confirmation raised him from the dead. And at the idea of being raised from the dead, he has lost the Greeks. All that the disciples manage are at this point some scoffs. And then there are a few who say, we, will, we, will, we would like to listen to you again. Now whether that is an earnest desire to listen to him again or, sim, uh, or, or, or purely Greek civility, uh, we do not know. However, Luke is saying that not everything has been lost. He, he, he gives us concrete names of people who actually converted. And once again, it's important for him to mention names of the people who are in the upper status of society, right? The echelons of society. So that he, he is seeming, or Christianity is seeming to be viable for people who are not just the poor and, 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 and perhaps the Greeks was con would consider them as, as, as ignorant, but that it is being accepted by people who are learned and wise and perhaps philosophers. And so you have the name Dionysius, a member of the court of the Areopagus, and a woman by the name of Demaris. And these two become believers. And from here, of course, then Paul will leave for Corinth. So a very, a very short passage, but, but boy, it is a model for so many things. And here's a practical, practical implication for today, right? How does Christianity encounter other cultures? That's one question. How do I encounter people of other religions personally in my own lives? These, these are questions that are important for the story of salvation to move on. And the Pauline model of of not condemning, but bearing witness to what we believe is, is, is such a beautiful way to evangelize. And as we look at the history uh, of evangelization, we realize that sometimes the encounter between Christianity and other cultures, uh, it's been brutal. There are very beautiful stories as well, but the colonial history has been, has, uh, we have plenty of, of um, of times when those encounters could have been uh, conducted so much better. So the question we ask is how do we encounter others, others as Christians? And Paul gives us a great model over here and so does Luke. And then I want you to, to, to reflect on, on this phrase, particularly as we encounter this pandemic. You know, people are asking existential questions. People are beginning to, to, to dwell on the deeper questions. What does it mean for us today? The God in whom we live and move and have our being. Meditate on that, contemplate on that, pray about it this phrase. The God in whom we live and move and have our being is right here on this altar. 
we do not worship an unknown God. We notice, sorry, we worship the one who is a stumbling block to the Jews. Foolishness to the Greek. But for us, Jesus Christ. Amen.